Ikadagi. I am delighted to see you all to this WIMS event for the International Day uh, of Women and Girls in Science. And I want to thank all the organizers for taking time to put together this and all the speakers for agreeing to our short time frame to share with us their experiences and lessons. To start um, this session, I'm going to welcome Dr. Jacqueline Uku, former WIOMSA president to Kickstarters. All right, uh, can, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. I see Jackie is frozen. Jackie, can you hear me? Jackie says in the text she's frozen. Uh, let's give it a minute to see if Jackie will unfreeze herself. These are things that happen with our technology and then we will change course if um, we can't unfreeze Jackie. So just give it 30 seconds. Uh, look at those beautiful faces of our WIOMSA board uh, of trustees as we wait for Jackie to come back. That's like a commercial break. All right, uh, I am not seeing Jackie on the screen. Um, I'm waiting for her to, to um, text me back. But before we do that, Jackie will come in later. I am going to give Obakeng, my co-moderator, this opportunity to welcome our next speaker, Obakeng. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to first introduce Dr. Nina. Dr. Nina Wambiji, who is a senior scientist at the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute in Mombasa. She has over 17 years of experience um, in marine fishery. She's a marine fisheries scientist and has worked on diverse multidisciplinary projects at national, regional, and international level with the focus on catches, distribution, and socioeconomic aspects. She's a recipient of numerous prestigious awards, a 2020 Pew Marine Fellow, the African Women in Research and Development Fellow in 2023, the African Biosciences Challenge Fund Fellowship in 2015, and an Australia Awards Africa Alumni, among many others. She's a member of the Global IUCN Snapper Sea Bream and Grant Specialist Group. Um, let's welcome Nina. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Obakeng. And uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Nina Ombiji from Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute, Mombasa. I'm the Vice President of the WAMSA, and I welcome you to this webinar on the International Day for Women and Girls. Our vision at WAMSA is to become a regional leader in promoting the development of marine and coastal science professionals, advancing marine and coastal science, 
and promoting the conservation of sustainable development of coastal and marine environment in the Wio region. We are a community of ocean researchers and champions that are contributing scientific evidence to influence policy and management interventions that can safeguard all that we do in our marine and coastal resources. So during WOMS's establishment in 1993, several of our founding members were strong women whose contribution to ocean science cannot be underscored. Today we have Dr. Nari Manjidawi from Zanzibar, who is part of that group that supported WOMSA in those very early days. Over the years, we considered it important to have a special focus on women and girls, and thus created the Women in Marine Science Network, WIMS, of which I know a number of you are aware of, to address the special needs of women in marine science. By hosting this virtual event, we celebrate how far we have come together. The theme of today's day, International Day for Women and Girls in Science, is bringing everyone forward for sustainable and equitable development. And it is anchored on six SDGs, which are namely SDG six, which is clean water and sanitation, SDG seven, which is affordable and clean energy, SDG nine, which is industry, innovation and infrastructure, SDG 11, sustainable uh, cities and communities. SDG 17, means of implementation. And last but not least, SDG 14, life below water. Our presentations today will focus primarily on SDG 14. And by doing so, I wish to emphasize that our contribution to life before what, below water provides support to all of the other SDGs. Just to point out a few, by providing sanitary support, we ensure that pollution and effluents are kept from the ocean. By providing clean energy, nations ensure that our forest cover is maintained and can function to hold sediments that would otherwise end up in the ocean and turn up, turn them from blue to brown seas. We will be showcasing some of the work in our region around these key areas of focus. In reference to SDG 17, as a means of implementation, I wish to mention that partnerships are key to the productivity of women in these areas. And I applaud all the men that have been in our partners in the past and present. Indeed, they have been the wind beneath our wings in so many ways. Thank you and welcome to this webinar. Thank you so much, Nina. And that was very, that was very informative. And a wonderful welcome to all the participants in the webinar. Um, so without wasting any more time, I would like to introduce our next speaker, who is Nancy Iraba. So Nancy is an award-winning marine scientist, dive master, and underwater program lead at Aqua Farms Organization, which is a youth-led organization championing marine conservation in Tanzania. She is also a co-founder and chief executive officer of Healthy sea, of the Healthy Seaweed Cafe, an award-winning social enterprise that innovates diverse seaweed for food products in Tanzania, while improving the lives of women seaweed farmers. Nancy is a convener of the Tanzania Dive Labs and aspires to see young marine scientists from globe from the global south have access to life access to life water and equipped with relevant underwater research skills. Nancy, take it away. Um, thank you very much, Oba Keng, and um, I, I hope I'm, I'm loud and clear. Just to begin with, I would like to wish everyone happy International Day for Women and Girls in Science. It's such an amazing time to, to be having our own day to celebrate and hear ourselves. And also, I'm so much excited about the theme of bringing everyone forward for sustainable and equitable development. So, so since my, my time is limited, I'll go straight to my presentation as introduced. I'm a marine scientist, I'm a dive master and a marine printer. I'm also a co-founder of two, um, two organizations, which is Aquafarms Organization, that is an NGO, but also I'm also a co-founder of a social enterprise, which works with um, creating seaweed-based foods, that is Healthy Seaweed Cafe. So next slide, please. So in my presentation, I'll be, I'll be taking you into two SDGs, which I'm addressing, that is life below water, 
which Dr. Nina is just from emphasizing, but also is directly connecting to goal number nine, which is industry innovation and infrastructure. Next slide. So with um, Life Below Water uh, for my organization, I'm the lead in, 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 in underwater program, um, which we aim at creating access to life below water, which they are known as Tanzania Dive Labs, which is a partnership with organization from South Africa known as NUF. And how did this come about? Um, it's because for my own journey, as I was venturing into being a marine scientist, um, I liked the skill of swimming, but also I, I had always desired to go deeper parts in the oceans and make research in the deeper part of the oceans as the researchers I see in geo, the ones I see on TV. So in 2021, I got support from, from an organization known as New, and I went from being a non-swimmer to a dive master. And for that, um, it gave me a sense of responsibility of how am I bringing more others into the sector uh, to be able to explore life below water without feeling limited, without feeling that we are only limited at the shores to only study maybe um, 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 the intertidal areas. How are we as young people going go go um, to, 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 to study the deeper parts of the ocean? So the Tanzania Dave Lab came to, um, to, to, to give an opportunity um, to train for underwater skill set and also to train young people from Tanzania up to advanced open water so as they can be able to explore deeper parts of the ocean without feeling limited. And up to date, um, about 20 um, youngsters have been supported. And this year we are looking into creating more access I mean, to the Uyo region, we have done um, a survey and we have identified a um, we have identified a need, and we are going to create more labs that are not only going to target Tanzania, but it's going to to target the whole of the Uyo region. And for me, um, this is a very huge enlightenment on how we can bring everyone on board because this program does not only concentrate on scientists alone, but it's also bringing on board storytellers and filmmakers, which is very crucial in 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 creating creating a world whereby um, our results as researchers can, can reach the grassroots, um, the grassroots levels. Next slide, please. Yes, and also in my another venture um, in which I co-founded, I, I co-founded this in 2020, um, it was also based on research. Um, we all know that Tanzania is the leading producer of seaweed in Africa and the third worldwide. But again, when you look um, at the story um, of seaweed, it's quite um, very sad on how much um, most of the markets are export dependent. So um, for my case, I came up with an innovation to make sure that our seaweed is muchly being used internally, um, rather than all of it 99% being used for export. And amidst um, Corona, um, amidst the, the, the pandemic, we also came to realize the need of eating healthy, organically healing foods. And for me, I came to identify that in the usage of seaweed, uh, most of us don't use seaweed for, seaweed for food. So um, in this social enterprise, I'm working with other two ladies um, whereby we are innovating um, different seaweed for foods products. And um, I kept this photo in my left to show that the ones who are holding those products are not marine scientists and they know nothing about marine. But again, um, because of awareness and um, because of the, of, the, of, the, of the principle of the company to try to bring everyone on board to make sure that we are aware of the foods, we are aware about the marine life. That's why you see these beautiful ladies are also consuming our products. And up to now we have about 1000 um, returning customers who are, every time they come back, they also ask about like, why should I consume seaweed? And again, when you give education on why people should consume seaweed, it also comes in alignment of people to realize of how big blue economy can grow. Because at the end of the day, um, why we, are, uh, we have challenges of bringing everyone on board is because of the lack of knowledge. There is, um, th there is this huge gap between scientists and then, and then this other public awareness of how huge we can grow and we can grow our sector of blue economy. So imagine having, um, have, having an innovation whereby someone can be eating um, seaweed every day in their daily diet. It means that even at the grassroots level, they know that, okay, blue economy is at my home and it is happening. 
And um, here I have a quote um, that when you look at the right side that skills development beyond classroom or theoretical curriculum and innovative mindset is what is going to bring everyone forward for sustainable and, equi and equitable de development. And for my case, um, what I have identified what we need is that we need scientists, storytellers, and filmmakers to work together. Because for, for so long, it has been a science for the case of science, but having labs like Tanzania Dive Labs, which gives access to young people, which gives access to young people having skill set of the underwater research skills, it means that it's opening more doors for more others to, to be able to have relevant skills of today. I can give an example of my own. When I soon became a dive master, I got an opportunity to lead a coral reef restoration. In, in today's world, you will see people of my color. You won't see many people of my color leading coral reef restoration. I'm probably even the first one from Tanzania. But right now, I can say that I have those skills. And once, once I gain those skills, um, international jobs open for me. And I can attest from those ones who have also passed from the skill development of being able to access life below water. I've also been called for international interview by WCS and some have, we have even collaborated to make stories in coastal communities that you can find them in YouTube. And also some of them have even been being shortlisted in the global stage. So it shows also a power of partnership when you come to work together, but also a power of us to tap into skills that are versatile. But also my next suggestion is we need more partnership and investment in exploring deeper parts of our ocean, especially for young people in the global south. There is a very big dispatch when it comes to skills development in ocean exploration. And for some of us in the global south, we are trying to create opportunities for others by bringing everyone on board, not only to consider marine scientists, but also to consider so it's also a high time that we have more partnerships because I know of only one organization, NUF, which is supporting young people at the core of its objectives. So also as grantees who are listening to this webinar, I think it is very important also to keep skills development, especially for young people in Global South in exploring deeper parts of the ocean because it's really making a difference. But also it's very important if we are to bring everyone forward to encourage marine ecotourism and marine print and marine entrepreneurship amongst university students. Because um, when it comes to marine ecotourism, you find, yes, we have mangroves, we have coral reefs, we have sea grasses. But again, for us, when we speak, we speak from maybe scientific point of view. And um, you go to Zanzibar, of course, there is so many um, type of tourism, or maybe even Kenya, so much of tourism now. I think also it's high time also young people, we look at the entrepreneurship side of marine, even in the tourism, to have concentrated um, um, marine ecotourism and marine preneurship that can also open eyes um, to, to, to more others. But lastly, I just wanted to note down that marine sciences requires versatile skill. We are in a world that is constantly changing. We're in a world that is um, technologically advancing. So skills like science communication, underwater research skills, and also partnership across sectors. As Dr. Nina said that SDG 14, it is cross-cutting across all sectors. So we also need intentionally to come together across all sectors and to have these versatile skills that can at last um, uh, move us forward. Next slide, please. Yes, and lastly, I would like to say thank you as introduced um, from this two organization and you can you can you can follow us um, in social media and um, and I hope that um, this type of webinar can be a way to explore partnerships and investments for now we are bringing everyone forward for sustainable and equitable development. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks, Nancy. Um, thank you so much. Such a an energizing conversation that's very relevant to, the, to today's theme. The next speaker, without further ado, that I will introduce is Dr. Narman Jidawi. But before I introduce her, I would like to just say that keep those questions coming, um, place them in the chat. We have our moderators looking at that. And if it's not in the chat, we also have the WhatsApp groups um, that we can see the questions. Dr. Nariman Jidawi is a senior lecturer in fisheries management at the Institute of Marine Sciences at the University of, um, University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. She also supervises masters and PhD students. Dr. Jidawi has 
extensive experience in conducting research in marine biology, where her work is closely tied to socioeconomic analysis, policy formulation, stakeholders, women empowerment, which is aimed at promoting marine conservation. She has conducted extensive multidisciplinary work across the East Africa coastline, the Wio region and internationally. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Nariman Chidawi, who has a lot of legacy in the Wio and for WIMS. Welcome Dr. Nariman. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to join you today on this important event. And uh, the first question I was asked to, to, to say is, how did I get into the ocean sciences? Maybe to say the truth to me, it just happened that uh, at that time when I completed my first degree a long time ago, the Institute of Marine Sciences was not, it was the East African Marine Fisheries Research Organization, IAMPRO, had very few local scientists. So the government recruited me to join as I had the right qualifications to work in the university. But also personally, being from an island state and surrounded by the ocean has made me to accept the offer easily because I love the ocean. I like to see the sea every time. Next slide, please. So maybe how did I, uh, bringing everyone forward, how I was able to open doors for young generations to, to engage in the ocean science space. To tell you the truth, if I'm given one hour, I will not finish what I've done. But in a nutshell, I will provide some very important issues I've done. For example, I provided lectures to girl students of secondary schools of Zanzibar as a room, woman role model on how best to achieve great heights in education and become, and become leaders. I provided lectures to a, a girls' schools, for example, at Bembela School, uh, and so on. I've also done training in village schools, for example, Kizimkazi Secondary School, where we train the kids to understand the importance of conserving the marine environment, as well as how to monitor the marine environment using quadras and transects, and how to identify the various marine organisms. Also, I've been, um, involved in making various uh, next slide please uh, yeah i've been involved in making various short videos to assist in creating awareness and highlight the importance of marine conservation together with the mid unit of the institute of marine sciences for example i made one called a peaceful struggle women involvement in fishing activities the past saint fisheries in zanzibar planning for sustainable tourism also another one, community in transition. They are available and if one, someone wants to see them at one point, they can ask me. I have motivated uh, young Pumba women through collaboration with the University of Rhode Island and the USAID support on how to use their marine resources in a sustainable manner by also teaching them how to monitor monthly so they understand the status of the resources. Also teaching them how to make jewelry using shells and how to help farming to empower them economically. Another slide. Through two projects also, Recomap and USAID, we built two little shops for the community to en en enable them to sell their products. Currently under the Sea Power Project, we are training the women how to cultivate seaweed in deep water, which is affected by high temperature to increase production. The three villages are Makangale in Pemba, Mungoni and Yamans in Damani in Ungudia. Also, we've done value addition recently on seaweed products so as to, to make them get more income. Right now, we're also training them how to swim to reduce their dependence on men, as you can see those pictures at the bottom. Also, another slide, please. Also, I, I've started at, at Kizim the Dolphin Tourism Association to assist in managing dolphins and train tour guides to do ethical boat trips without harming the dolphins. I've written some books and made videos related to marine conservation, which I've already mentioned. Somehow it just got repeated here. So this, at the bottom, you can see some of the books I wrote with Chumbe and with other colleagues. Next slide, please. Next slide. So 
I, which sustainable development goals are used? I know poverty, so that uh, access to basic human needs of health, education, and sanitation, zero hunger, providing food and humanitarian relief, establishing sustainable food production, gender equality, education regardless of gender, advancement of equality laws, fair representation of women, decent work and economic growth, and as others said, life below water. Um, Dr. Narman, can yes. you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. So um, what, what are my, these are my last words that I want to, to give to the young leaders, that management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. I would like to emphasize that the young generation should continue to love the ocean and continue to conserve it for the benefit of the current and future generations. As the ocean is life, and life begins from a young stage to the elder generations like us. So I encourage them to take a lead in making the ocean productive, clean, and resilient for the sustainability of our lives. Thank you. Amazing. Um, amazing presentation, Dr. Naman. And as I said in the beginning, you are an icon in the WIO region and internationally. A lot, this presentation of seven minutes doesn't do justice to the work that you have done over the years and the influence you've had across the WIO region and many people you have inspired. I would like to take this next opportunity to engage Nancy and Dr. Nauman in a panel. I am caught off guard because Dr. Nauman has already covered all that I was hoping to ask her. But it's also inspiring because it made me aware of the real story, uh, real stories, authentic um, information that we don't get to give in this forum. I'll start with you, Dr. Narman. I see you've worked on women empowerment. You've realized the gaps that are there, including teaching women how to swim. So in the context of what we see now in terms of the ocean decade, what do you think is left to do? If you had energy in your tank right now, what would you do that you haven't done? Okay, sorry, I did not admit it. I'm just saying that uh, we just started this training of swimming recently, and so there is a long way to go for Zanzibar. I mean, uh, it's not easy to do such a thing, especially when there are men around. Maybe one thing is to make the men also understand that there is a need to empower their, the women as well, so that they should not harass them when they want to swim and these kind of things. And also, we want to enforce about the issue of safety, safety while in the ocean. I mean, they can know how to swim, but maybe they don't know how to be safe. So that's another thing we want to train and maybe finally to make them like Nancy to do how to snorkel and dive. But first is, is that one. And then the other things can come later. For example, personally, I did diving when I was, the, I just joined IMS, it was compulsory. But then I never went back again to dive. I just did other things which are not uh, involving diving. But to these women who are doing uh, uh, seaweed farming have to learn how to swim so that they ensure that their safety in the ocean. So these are just uh, like to say that just thinking that they should be empowered more to learn how to swim and to, to teach their children also how to swim. Thanks, Naman. Thanks, Naman. And a good segue to the question I have for Nancy. Nancy, you mentioned that one of the things that has inspired you in your work as an ocean scientist is to engage in marine entrepreneurship. When we think about our universities, our curriculum, and as agents of change, what would you like to see our universities do in the efforts to improve the education of marine sciences and oceans? 
Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that question, Nelly. Um, maybe before I delve into it, um, I just want also to inform um, that last month I was selected by University of Dar es Salaam to become a member of the advisory board for the for the change of um, curriculum. Right now, um, the university here in Tanzania, they are they are reviewing their curriculum. They want to update them so as they can meet the labor market. So first of all, I'm happy that I'll be sitting as a member um, to, to, to be advising the university. So for my case, um, if, first of all, if I delve in my story, for me, all I wanted to, to do at first, I just wanted to become a, a, a scientist. I don't have, I, 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 I was not born with entrepreneurship mindset. But at the end of the day, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's about the need. So for me, I really want to, to see um, um, university students are, are also being trained in solving the real um, problems that are happening in our communities. And at the end of the day, it's really important to also teach them to go out of their comfort zone. So for my case, um, is yes, I'm leading. I'm I'm leading this um in, in innovative seaweed for food company, but again, um I really do have a team that um th that is that that is that, that that we have different different strengths, and at the end of the day, I can rely on those strengths. And what I've come to realize is that sometimes what we are being taught in class is quite very um different with, when when you come to the outside world, especially when it comes to to marine. So I think that is really it's really important to to update the curriculum. To, 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 to be um, in relevancy with the, with the labor market needs. And in order to do that, it's quite also very important to bring different partners on board across all the SDGs, because when we bring only ourselves on board, we are going also to, to, to have the same, same suggestions which we have had over years. But when we go also outside our comfort zone, bringing different people from different angles, we are going to get very, very good suggestion. Like um, for my case, I think one of the things that stood up for me um, to be able to enter in the entrepreneurship journey is also ability to write in a way that I could pull grants. So currently, I've been able to pull grants from people of the US, um, United States African Development Foundation and also Safe Suite Coalition. But in order also to be able to pull those grants, you have to learn some skills of writing in a way that you can also pull capital. Because at the end of the day, why aren't we starting business? We are not starting business because we don't have capital. But again, the ability of pulling those capital also lies in the, first of all, there is mentorship, but also there is relevant skills. So I think where to start is, um, I, I don't have a solution that can say that this is a solution and, and if we apply it, it's going to change the sector. But I think the first thing, I think um, University of Dar es Salaam, I can really applaud that they're already um, leading away by, by, by refining in the curriculum. So I think the next stage is to be bringing different um, people from across sectors on board and see also how are we training entrepreneurship mind to go relevant with the labor market needs of this century. Thanks, Nancy. Um, in the interest of time, I have one question for both of you before I take a glance at the chat. So keep the ideas, the questions, the suggestions, the congratulatory messages on the chat. So Nancy and Naman, I'll start with you, Naman. Uh, thinking about the theme of um, this year's International Women and Girls in Science, bringing everyone in the uh, equitable and sustainable development, what would you tell the little boys and girls on the streets of Dar es Salaam, Zanzibar, or even Kenya? Narman, one minute. Okay, maybe what I can tell them is that they should listen to what they are advised. For example, if they're advised not to use destructive uh, gears in the ocean, they should uh, try to listen and obey to those rules. Or if they are asked to replant, let's say, seagrass, maybe they should do those kind of things. And instead of just doing what they want, because if you listen to advice and if you uh, follow the rules, then things are going to be done in the right way. Because there's a saying that if it has to be, it's up to me. If I want my environment to be nice and good, then it's me who should play the first role than to leave it to others. Nancy, 
Um, thank you. I'm not far from Naaman, but for me, I have two categories for all the streets, um, kids and boys in the streets, and also for those in the sector. For, so for all, um, I just want to tell them there are a lot of opportunities along the marine sciences value chain, and our eyes should be wide open because blue economy is already the next big thing. And for those already in the sector, I advise them to seek for knowledge and exposure and not just to lie on what we are being taught in class, to go out of the comfort zone because opportunities are there. Okay, Nancy, uh, one last question before I give it to Oba Keng. We are talking about young people, some which may not understand what blue economy is. They may not understand what the ocean decade is. If you were to go back, what would you have changed about what inspired you to walk on the journey of becoming who you are today? Uh, sorry, Nelly, can you repeat your question? What, what I would have changed? Yes. So if you were to go back, what would you have changed about your journey of becoming who you are today? Uh, I, I'm not sure if I would be having the power to change, but for me, um, in my journey, I didn't, I didn't go in a journey having so much of role models because I had Dr. Narman. Dr. Narman was my very first teacher in my PT when I went to Zanzibar, and I started admiring people like Dr. Narman, Dr. Blandina. But again, um, I, I think there was no much of diversity. So for me, what I would change, I would give marine sciences more power, especially for, 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 for women, so as um, the next generation can grow to have relevant role models, because I'm also trying to become a relevant role model. But I wish at that time there could be a lot of Dr. Narmans, Dr. Blandinas, Dr. Ninas. If I could see a lot of those, I think it could make a very huge um, difference in my life, because at, 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 at some point in my career, I was so confused. Thank you. Oba King. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a great, like the panel has been great, the questions and the answers. Um, but before moving on, I just had one question. Can I can I ask one more question? Yes, um, I was. I hope it's fine. In yes, I was opening. Time. Yes, I was opening the floor for you for questions as I look at the chat. So go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So this question is for Nancy, and then this is in the interest of entrepreneurship. And one of the comments, one of the statements she made was that she would like to explore and to expand towards into the Rio region. So looking at Seaweed Cafe and the ladies that you're working with, do you think they, do you think there's a possibility for you to expand your business model beyond um, Tanzania, Tanzanian and Zanzibari water, waters and um, start implementing the same business plan and the, um, within your neighboring countries as you're growing? And what do you need in terms of that? Um, okay, Obakeng, thank you. Thank you so much for the question. So in terms of expanding the business, first of all, I just need to, I, I just need to highlight that um, I've been getting um, a lot of um, messages from Kenya. Also, how can we partner even from outside the globe? How can we partner to, to, to expand the business um, beyond borders? So they're, they're there. Um, they're ex they're, I mean, there are plans to, to get relevant partners um, in real regions and to expand the business model forward. But also, um, I just need maybe to mention some of the challenges. Because um, in every business there are challenges, and maybe um, I can I can speak here to the group of scientists. So as you know, like for instance, um, one of the challenges for in the in the seaweed for food sector is issues around shelf life. Because you know, for over thirty years, um, seaweed has been exported while it's in its raw form. And um, to tell someone that this raw form of seaweed, you can, eat, you can use it for food. For some people, it, it doesn't make sense. That's why value addition for seaweed for food and infusing it maybe in different fruits, it becomes quite very relatable to put in the table. But again, this is a product which has only um, 28 days and it has to be 28 days up to expiration date and it has to be kept um, in the fridge all the time. So we are currently working on the issues of increasing shelf life. 
so as it can be able to sustain for long because we also want to be able to maintain its natural texture. It has no meaning if we're going to, to sell things with chemicals. We want to sell things which are which is ocean superfood and it has ocean nutrients um, that are pure. So after we are done with that research, it's going to be very easy um, to, to, to start thinking about expansion because right now, even when we get orders to, to transport in the other regions to, of Tanzania, it's, it's already a headache because um, it might reach there and then at the end it, it has gone bad because it cannot stay so long without being refrigerated. So that's why I, I called out for innovative mindset. That's why I said there are a lot of opportunities because in every challenges there are opportunities. So there is also an opportunity to improve a seaweed for food industry, but also to create even more. There is even a vision to create even more products to come up with seaweed chilies, with seaweed crepes. So it's not a must that only Nancy's company to do that. You know, that's why I'm saying even university students, they can think of the sector and they can become um champions of, of 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 even more innovation in their own country thank you so much nancy and that is very enlightening and also um part of your answer i was also answering um, i'm looking at the chat was also answering epi epiphania's question on um advice you have for graduates so um, I'm also gonna move on to another question. So I'm looking at the chat and one of the questions comes from Renise Ojwala who asked, um, what are some of the challenges that have hindered your work, have hindered you to do your work? And um, this is for both Dr. Narman and Nancy. Just briefly, please. Sorry, I didn't get the question clearly. What okay, was the, um, the, the question is, um, what are some of the challenges that have hindered your work? Uh -huh. Maybe I can say that the biggest challenge which I'm facing, for example, I'm working with women entrepreneurs. We help them, we provide them with equipment, machineries, we train them various things, but still they never learn how to be dependent. They always, they are always, I mean, to be independent. They're always dependent. All the time they'll ask for this and that. So that's what I'm struggling now to train them how to keep records, how to keep spare money so that they can understand how to progress forward without being dependent on other people. This is what I, I'm, I'm struggling. Also, maybe I can say that there are certain things since I joined the, the, my, I mean, this profession, like use of destructive fishing gears, you know, uh, use of maybe poison, for fishermen not following the rules have been ongoing for many years. So it's just, uh, I'm thinking of what to do now to make this disappear. Because I don't know, maybe those who are listening, they're facing the same problem. There's this issue of use of destructive fishing gears and, and conflicts, uh, between this village and that village has been going for many years. So it's one big challenge and I'm thinking of ways of how to tackle it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nariman. Um, Nancy, do you have a response to the question? Yeah, I think the question is about challenges, right? Yes. So I think for my case, um, my biggest challenge I can say is around um, being a leader. Um, I think we all know um, sometimes the challenges we as female leaders um, face is quite not the same with, with uh, what our other counterparts um, are, are facing. So there are some challenges regarding um, leadership and I can give a relevant example. Like um, two years ago, um, I was leading a team coral reef restoration in Zanzibar Member Island. And um, the team that I was leading, it was a team of, it was a team of males. And it was quite, it, it was quite very, very hard because you, you, so, you know, like I'm this tiny and um, there is some time someone thinks that ah she 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 she's just this tiny girl like how can she be our our leader so it takes sometimes energy to prove yourself that you are capable and sometimes that can really be energy draining and um another thing is just being trusted um you know as as young people when we write proposals 
um, there is a way that you, you, you are not being trusted if you can deliver. Yes, uh, so for me, those are main challenges, but um, again, we continue pushing for progress. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to move on to the second part of the webinar, which looks at um, three other speakers. So opening up on this, um, on the second part of it is Sam Kim Guni. Sam Kim Guni is South African and has 12 years experience as sustainability professional and is currently a chief executive officer and co-founder of Regis Tree, which is a community conservation mangrove restoration venture in Watamu, Kenya. She's currently a trigger, she's currently a triggering exponential climate action fellow with BFA Global, where her co-founded venture registry is developing community-led conservation projects that include mangrove restoration and the realization of alternative livelihoods. Samke, please take it away. Um, thank you all again, um, and a good morning to everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I am dialing you from South Africa, uh, where I am based most of the time when I'm not um, along the coast of Kenya, and I'm very pleased to be with you today. For me, science really represents solutions for social injustice. I think primarily that is my introduction to the sciences, um, and I want to highlight that as well as part of the way that women and girls in the science can engage with science because science is the rationale behind innovation um, and the very reason why we're able to have ventures within the marine ecosystem is because science gives us the backing to go after um, kind of the innovative ideas that we have in our head and realize them as actual business ventures. So I'm going to speak a little bit about my journey getting to um, where I am today, uh, my career journey, as well as to also highlight how different our journeys can be leading up to our action in marine sciences. So thank you again for the next slide. So my name is Samke. I started off as a socio-ecological research intern. So I started off as a researcher and I worked for Isambelo Kizid in wildlife. And I really looked at how communities live alongside natural resources and are able to derive not only a living, a living from natural resources, but even just our identity is really linked um, to the natural ecosystems and spaces that we find ourselves in. So that is how I framed you know, the way that I've worked around um, the different jobs that I've had leading up to becoming an entrepreneur. I then moved along, you know, my journey has been interesting in the sense that I've not stuck to one particular um, sector or field, but you will see that there is a common thread of being concerned with the community specifically. I moved to WWF as a biodiversity officer and eventually manager. So I moved quite quickly in the ranks of leadership when it comes to the conservation space. I think my, my most dramatic leaps from being an intern to management happened within the space of three years. So it was quite, um, a large leap and I think that also speaks to when you have the correct mentor um, in your career, they can really accelerate your trajectory. And I think I want to highlight that when we start thinking about how do we bring everyone forward towards sustainable and equitable development. I then um, moved into social impact consulting. I recognized that even though I was working in the environmental space, I was actually really interested in understanding social impacts. How do we quantify social impacts? How do we measure um, the value that society derives from the interventions that we have in the natural ecosystem? And then how do we take those social impacts that are often seen as abstracts and start to quantify them as financial gains and a reason for um, investing financially in the lives of those that live along coastal communities. I've moved along the journey. Um, my most recent role from WWF was the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund where I was working on youth leadership and youth leadership and entrepreneurship for me made me realize that actually maybe I wanted to start my own venture and become an entrepreneur. So I applied for the TECA Triggering Exponential Climate Action Fellowship, which is BFA funded. And it really took me from the point of having great ideas, but no financial muscle to now being able to implement registry, which is um, the venture that I have. 
If you saw the picture that I had in the first slide, the two ladies that are there actually are two ladies that are, are quite close to me. The one is Fadosa Mustafa, that's my co-founder, and she's interviewing um, a community member that works on seaweed um, ventures. And we are trying to understand, you know, what are community needs and how can we build our business to impact her life specifically? Um, so if you go to the third slide, sorry, Obaking, I'm just making you now work for your for your salary this morning. The third slide, you will see these are the same women, same ecosystem. So these are this these pictures, by mind you, are not stock images. This is from our field trips. We just had a really amazing photographer come with us. We started to look at well, okay. So now that we've spoken to these women and we understand their needs, what are the facts and how can we build a venture that is going to impact them? So these are the facts when it comes to venture building, innovation and business in the ocean economy specifically is severely underfunded. Um, with regards to global venture capital investments, Africa itself accounts for less than 1% of global um, funding raised and funding flows. That means if you look at the global trillion dollar funding um, ecosystem, Africa only gets less than 1% of that. You can imagine how little of that funding then flows towards women. So the fact that Fedosa and myself were able to receive this grant, it means that there is an opportunity for women to start having a claim and a stake in the innovation space when it comes to entrepreneurship. Now, why I am pointing out the, the funding flows and investments towards Africa specifically is because Africa is the youngest continent in the world and it is leapfrogging more than most emerging markets when it comes to technology trends. So most of us here will have heard of Mpesa and a lot of the FinTech kind of innovations. Africa is quite literally leading in that space. So for there to not be an equitable distribution of funding as it relates to innovation in the African continent means that there is going to be a disparity in how we're able to partake in these new economies that are springing up. Now, if you imagine that women get even less of that 1% of funding, you can imagine that the women you see on your screen are not going to be able to sustainably and speedily move and advance into the fourth industrial revolution alongside the world. So the facts are women are being left behind, but also the facts are there are opportunities and there is a future that we can co-create using science as a backing and then most importantly for me, using funding and money. So if you look at women and, and, what, and how they engage with the, with the blue economy and the oceans and that ecosystem, they constitute 80% of people that are forcibly displaced by climate-related shocks in emerging markets. Um, we know that one of the, the, the stats that Africa is faced with is women-led homes um, and the fact that even when you look at conservation at a rural context, the, the people that are mostly involved in conservation practice are elderly or older middle-aged women. So if the same women that are engaged in the ocean economy from a subsistence, subsistence level, from a conservation level, are also the ones that are disproportionately impacted by climate action, it means that the solutions related to climate action within the blue economy need to come from women, all right? Women also make up the majority of the unbanked, meaning that women are excluded from financial systems. They don't have formal ways of banking. Therefore, they don't have formal ways of receiving income. So if this, for me, I always look at matters in the way that they compound each other. If we're saying that we are going towards goal five of the sustainable development goals, which is gender equality, we need to address these systematic imbalances. Um, we need to look at how we redress access to capital for women, specifically those that are in the rural context. So when I, when I say what are the opportunities that are there and what is the future we can co-create, I see the opportunity being interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary collaboration. I, I've heard from um, you know really well-learned women um, on this panel that are doctors, that are scientists in their own right, but imagine scientists coming together with business owners coming together um, with community leaders because these women are community leaders and coming up with solutions and including technology because technology does not have to be far removed um, from our natural spaces including technology i think the gains towards goal five can be significant 
So there are some examples of how the ocean economy can benefit. We at Registry, which is my um, um, venture with Fedosa, are looking at introducing um, AI. So we're looking at introducing how um, artificial intelligence has the ability to generate um, the new futures. So we're looking at how you can look at a mangrove ecosystem and take AI to help you generate a future plan um, that will include even how it will look with hatcheries within it, um, how the uh, livelihoods that can be developed within that mangrove will look like. And these include things like um, uh, beekeeping, they include tourism, they include a variety of already existing ventures, but how we can scale those using AIs. So those are the opportunities um, that are presented in the blue economy space. Next slide, please. I think you missed one before that. Okay, the careers one. Um, Samke, please just take note of time. We'll give you. Okay, that one. All right. So I was, uh, one of the conversations we had when preparing for this was also to highlight some of the careers in the ocean economy. I've spoken about how my venture has to do with mangrove restoration. So that really sits uh, within. I'd say two and three of the careers I've highlighted. So the African carbon markets, we are restoring mangroves specifically for African carbon markets where carbon credits can be um, shared equitably with communities. That is the, the revenue that is derived from there. But there's also a variety of other careers. There's research, you know, knowledge generation and data is critical when it comes to what we can do in the ocean economy because it drives the investments that are made in the ocean economy. And without that data, without that research, um, investors have no way of knowing where to put their money. There's also aquaculture and fisheries. So there are some eco value chains that are being co uh, created right now um, that are very interesting and exciting in the African space where people are looking at, well, what are the value chains that exist within our ecosystems and how can we track those? And people are then entering into um, solar energy for refrigeration for the produce that comes out of the oceans. So those are the opportunities presented. And of course, tourism is a well-known one in Africa. How do we utilize um, tourism as a, a key accelerator of bringing um, income and skills development into the blue economy? So I think I'll stop there for the purpose of time. I did want it to be a bit more interactive, but I think time is just never on our side. So the, the last slide is a question and answer. If there are specific things you'd like me to address, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you so much, Samke. Very intriguing and interesting. So for the interest of time, I'm not, I'm going to skip the questions section and then we're going to go on to the next speaker, which is Dr. Isabel. And then rather we'll have questions at the end after Valentine has spoken. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Isabel Marquez de Silva, who is from Portugal and studied aquatic science at ICBAS and worked at the Lisbon Oceanarium for a while before moving to Mozambique in 2006. She worked where she worked as a volunteer. She consulted for WWF, IUCN, and WCS. In 2009, she joined the University of Lurio, where she currently teaches. In her eight years, she's dedic dedicated to marine conservation in Cabo Delgado, and mainly to issues of co-management of fisheries and development of the community sanctuary of Amizi Island. Her great passion is scuba diving, which she started practicing in 1992. She's an expert in underwater monitoring, trained Mozambican diver biologist, and trained Mozambican diver biologist on the island of Amizi is called Kerera, the fish that does not stop. Um, Dr. Isabel, please take it away. Dr. Isabel, um, you may start, but I think you might have, you might be muted. Forgot to unmute. 
So thank you uh, for being a, a panelist and to accept me. I hope I, I keep the quality of the talks is very challenging. So um, for me, it was very easy to choose the sea and be a marine biologist. I grew up by the sea and I fall in love by the Mozambican sea. And, and that was natural uh, moving to Mozambique in 2006. Um, so I stopped working in Mozambique in a conservation project in Vamizi Island, uh, where um, I, I did a conservation work inside a lodge. And then I moved to the university where I was able to start a curriculum uh, inside the curriculum of biological science in the University of Luriu uh, to start uh, a class of diving, uh, snorkeling and swimming. So basically of the 60 students we receive every year, uh, only two or three know how to swim. And for me, it was very shocking in growing up by the sea, always with the feet in the water to see that Mozambique is so back to the sea and so little, um, so few persons know how to swim. And so during uh, all this, uh, this time that I've been lecturing in the University of Luriu, we've been uh, having uh, students go out of the first year of biological science, know how to swim and snorkel. And with the support of other projects, we've been uh, having a lot of diving courses and, and we, uh, I formed more than uh, 30 students, uh, diving students, dive masters. And uh, here are some of the goals that um, uh, have a career on, on science. Uh, Michelle is my uh, master's uh, student and she's studying um, art corals. And then Maida that is now working in a local NGO, also uh, doing um, mon underwater monitoring and community work. And, um, and also um, Bibiana that is now doing her PhD with FAO uh, in uh, soft corals. So I think uh, my passion of, of the sea engaged a lot of, of projects around me and in the university. Uh, so uh, I put some pictures of the projects I was engaged. I will, my first research subject in Mozambique was uh, turtles, and you can see in the in the left side the the turtle monitoring group, uh, women group. Uh, there's not a lot of men doing turtle research, and because um, uh, Vamizi Island gets into the South Equatorial Current uh, dividing zone gets a lot of garbage uh, not from Mozambique but from the rest of the world I was always very engaged on marine litter and so it was um, nice to help uh, one of my students Jelly Kenteka to start with my own uh, uh, the marine litter project and and so help the turtles to have space in the beaches to 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 have their nests um, my uh, university also engaged girls in, in different um, uh, issues. And we have a very good reptile um, education pro program. And it's very interesting because it's, it's, um, it's, um, Africans have a lot of afraid of, of, of snakes. And it's very interesting to see even girls getting interested in reptiles. Next slide, please. So um, in Vamizia, I start with the, with the fishery department and the, the lodge, this uh, big project, one of the longest um, marine, local marine managed areas, protected areas in Mozambique and I think in the region. And it's a good uh, mix of the university, the, um, the private sector, and, and, uh, and, and the fisheries. And, um, and even now that uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but uh, Cabo Delgado, we, we are in uh, a war situation. Uh, we have uh, terrorist uh, attacks uh, around the province. We managed to keep with this partnership between the university and the lodge that then went out. The investors keep investing on the conservation project. The women were very important all the time in the managing of the local uh, marine protected area uh, is impossible to, to, to work without them in the group and their power. Next slide. 
So uh, because I'm, I'm in this area that is very difficult to get financing uh, after 2017 because of this uh, war context, one of the, the investors of most of my development projects are ENI, the, the, the oil company. And so I was able to, to do some uh, work uh, on coral restoration. And because we are working in such poor um, countries, is, uh, in countryside, it's very difficult not to do uh, 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 sustainable development goal, anger and, and, um, and poverty reduction because we need to address these things. So uh, here we work with women to, to produce their own uh, dresses and, 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 and the school uniforms. And, um, and so together with coral restoration and the research project, we're also developing women's groups and activities with them. Um, next slide. And so it was uh, quite natural after we finished that project, we start another one of, coral, of uh, mangrove restoration. Uh, this time uh, more near the, the capital of the province in, in, uh, in Makufi, and it's yeah, still going on. And together with the, with the mangrove restoration, uh, we also uh, work with partners to do uh, uh, water and sanitation and nutrition education. So conservation is not standing alone. It's not just replanting mangroves. We need to 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 help people uh, reducing poverty and angry. So another component of the project with another NGO is um, agriculture uh, plots and agriculture uh, education. And, and, uh, and besides that, we are researching with women and, and, and experimental in um, agriculture of uh, mussels and beekeeping inside the mangrove. So next slide. So uh, it's the first time we're trying to do uh, mussel production in the, in the in Mozambique, especially in the north. Uh, and it's very interesting the enthusiasm of the of the girls to 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 put together and um, and, and and try to sell the, their products in the city and um, and uh, until now we're having a, a little bit of success so yes I think this is my last slide thank you very much and uh, I'll open to questions when we came to time to, to, to receive questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tassova. Dr. Tassova. Um, I'm just gonna go to the next speaker, um, which is Valentine. Um, Dr. Okay. Valentine is- Over yes. King. Um, can we um, can we take questions as the next speakers uh, prepare so that we are not making the audience wait for a long time? I think it would be interesting mm -hmm. um, to hear what the audience has. So uh, we're gonna open it to the audience. Anyone in the chat, please look at those questions. There is a question. Um, there is a question that came in from Renice that I would like uh, the two speakers to dwell on before we jump into the specific question. So Isabel Samuke, thank you so much. It's inspiring to hear what you've both done uh, from grassroots to linking your work with policy. We are interested to hear what have been the key challenges that have hindered your work similar to what we asked Dr. Dawi and Nancy. Um, one yes, think, minute for each one of you. Okay. Uh, I think uh, one of my greatest challenges is being taking um, Mozambicans to, to see the sea in a different way, to love the sea, because you never can protect what you don't know and what you, you don't love. And I think conservation of, of the oceans passed by 
putting the persons with the face in the water and loving the sea. And I think Mozambicans only saw the sea as producing food. And for me, my biggest challenge of my life is trying to change that idea so that persons who have uh, the sea in Mozambique and can help us to develop it sustainably. Um, and of course, being in a province that is being devastated by the war and trying to do something to help the people here uh, and, 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 and still uh, do some work and, and, and keep teaching in the university. Thank you, Thank you. Savel. There's a question. There's a question I'll keep for you from Efifania, but I want to hear from Samuke. What yeah. has been the greatest challenge in your journey? Well, to, trying to go into entrepreneurship, the biggest challenge is that when you want to conserve the environment, investors want to see a, a viable business model, which I think is inherently a bit contradictory to what conservation is about for me in the way that I understand it. Conservation is intrinsically valuable because it sustains people and organisms. And so that shouldn't be something that we always try to put a monetary value to. But the way that business is set up, people want to see a viable business product and model. And so when you value perhaps people's well-being and livelihoods, it is not seen always as a viable business opportunity. So I think that's my biggest challenge. But also, I would maybe challenge a little bit of Isabel's position because my experience is different that people that live in coastal communities do value natural ecosystems and the ocean in my in my experience but maybe the way that their reliance on the on the natural ecosystem for their actual livelihoods translates it translates maybe to overconsumption in some spaces it translates maybe to um not necessarily being able to take care of it because it's so linked to their economic well-being as well um, and when you're able to give them viable economic opportunities, you start seeing that quite naturally, they believe and understand in conservation and taking care of the natural environment. So I think it's a little bit of a differing experience there. Thank you. Um, I have one last question before I look at the chat. You both talk about um, connecting with communities. For some, okay, you're looking at women, women involvement in um, uh, ocean conservation. Isabel, you're working with communities in research. It is the same question I asked Nariman. What is left, given that we have the theme of bringing everyone equitable and sustainable development? What can we do to bring more women? Because we are constantly coming to the International Day of Women and Science and saying they steal more people out of the door. So what is left for us? Uh, I can start. <laughs> uh, I think um, I will pick up what the, 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 my colleague the panelists spoke about sustainability of the projects and, and business plans. I think a lot of projects have been done in, in Mozambique uh, to help the women and the community groups, but some uh, times when the NGOs uh, leave, is no sustainability. So I think it's still a lot to do uh, uh, in, in doing the projects sustainable and, and with business plans so that when we leave, um, the, the, the women are independent and connecting also what Narima said about make them independent, make them sustainable by themselves. I think that is the biggest challenge on, on doing community works and, and working with women groups, do projects and, uh, and, and, and business plans that are sustainable for the future of them and that can, be, uh, can stay be behind the project length. Thanks, Isabella. I like how you're bringing the issue of um, sustainability and resonates with what Nauman said on independent women and communities. Samke. Um, I think global, regional, and local 
collaboration is what will take us forward if we're asking what needs to be done. So I think regionally, we need to start having more um, unified agendas and speak to each other and building on research. Um, I know that with researchers, sometimes we want research grants um, to fund a particular issue, but we need to start looking at what research gaps exist and develop grants that are aligned to the actual gaps in knowledge versus uh, proving things that have already been proven. I think for me also as a mother, early childhood developments should include um, the understanding of the natural environment. So from the time that children start to even conceptualize themselves, they should do so in relation to the environment. And so that it's, it doesn't become this new conversation as an adult, but something that's inculcated quite young. So I think our education system needs to really incorporate into our curriculums, just a, a way of understanding nature um, quite early. So I think that's maybe what needs to be done um, to get us forward. Wow, Samke and Isabel, uh, I could keep asking questions. I see in the chat, I want to be very um, caution about time. So those questions will be asked, so keep them coming. Um, one parting shot from you, Samke, is not to forget the young people and bring out a feature about being a mother, which is very critical um, in terms of thinking about those young ones and bringing them onto this journey early on. Thank you so much. I am going to move it to Obaking for the next um, panel speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, one thing I want to say, I just want to read this comment because um, we've just been talking about the challenges and looking at what some kids are working on with the restoration as well. Um, James Cairo wrote, um, he has a comment where he, he works also in Kenya. And then one of the challenges he says, um, says my challenge with mangrove based enterprises is scaling up for both. So, oh, it was a question. So for both speakers, how are you addressing the sustainability of mangrove startups such as beekeeping and tourism? Um, I'll let you think about it and then um, you can answer it at the end. So I'll move on to introducing Valentine. Um, so uh, Dr. Valentine is the founder and director of Avenues, a social sustainability company hosted in Nairobi. She was um, she was program manager of Cities and Coast. Her current, her current area of interest is the sustainable city planning, climate change and cities, land use and land cover changes in cities, blue economy and coastal cities. She's a corporate architect and a planner registered by the Kenya Institute of Planners, an accomplished, an accomplished researcher and consultant in the built environment. She is an external examiner for the School of Architecture and Planning at the University of Witwatersrand, Wits University. Um, she's also a reviewer for the Global Climate Fund for Kenya, hosted by the Ministry of Finance and Planning and a member of Planning Schools of Africa. Valentine, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Wakeng. Uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon. Um, as I've been introduced, my name is Valentine. I'm the founder and currently the manager of Evanas. Evanas is a sustainability company um, and, 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 and consultancy that looks at sustainable cities and especially the vulnerable entities within those cities. Uh, I'm proud to say that Evanas as a company, as we have grown, is a female-led company with all the directors being female. And we have gone steps ahead in trying to make sure that as we grow as women and move from one step to the other, we are lifting the girls and the women behind us to come to our level and be able to answer to issues of SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities. Uh, just if I can explain the photo you're seeing, we were having a conference then when I was still working with Wyomsa. Uh, where we had some female-led programs that I managed that were presenting on the work that they do within uh, the Western Indian Ocean region. Next slide, please. Um, how did I come into this ocean space? 
I was introduced to the ocean space uh, when I got into lecturing immediately after my master's degree. And I was lecturing at a coastal university in, in Mombasa, Kenya. And during that process, I learned that my, my profession of planning actually, as we are saying, did not expose me much to, to an environment where you are planning two different environments, two different ecosystems. And so from that, I got an interest into understanding how can I improve my skills in terms of design, uh, placement of cities, planning of cities with regards to the marine environment. So that's how I got into the ocean environment through the university. And when I went into school for my doctorate studies, I did a study on coastal uh, systems and coastal cities and climate change. And since then, uh, I've been able to do conduct research on SDG 11 and especially measuring on coastal ecosystems. And I've con continued that with the Evan as a uh, company that I'm doing now, which is more of a research and entrepreneurship company on how we are expanding and giving women leverage and space to start looking at solutions uh, uh, within coastal uh, cities. Next slide, please. Um, just to, uh, a little bit about the previous photo, we had a meeting in, in, in Zanzibar and we, we, with the Zanzibar government, Zanzibar government wanted some, some, some information and knowledge concerning uh, water resource conservation and management. And we invited some very key women who are in this field and they were able to give very uh, important um, ideas. Uh, on this one, again, I'm saying um, women are very key in terms of when we're looking at global in terms of production and consumption, whether it's in the marine environment or whether it's the land environment. And they are also very key in helping deal with the tripartite challenge of Western pollution, climate change, and biodiversity. So looking at those photos, one of the training sessions, I mean, three, not really one, three training sessions I had when I was still working with Wyomsa, where we were looking at gender and women and cities and how we can be able to improve lives, if you can see those slides, and just be able to bring together science and policy and be able to change lives. And when you're looking at SDG, 11 cuts across several of them, uh, because when you're working with cities and coastal cities, then you are looking at how you are going to help communities to be able to be reliant, to be able to get food, to be able to be sustainable. And we have had, have had several trainings of that. Uh, the, the next one is uh, looking at how uh, empowered girls in looking at monitoring SDG. This is a project we were doing uh, with UN Habitats yet to be finished on how to monitor SDGs for Kenya and, and, and Tanzania and, and how to be able to report in the global reporting of SDGs. And during one of during the meetings in, in Zanzibar, some of our girls that we have been supporting and helping were able to get uh, awards for presenting our works that can be able to be replicated physically on the ground. So I have, we have built an opportunity and we have opened space in terms of academic mentoring as a lecturer, and I continue to do that now, and op open opportunities for enhancement of skills and development for the girls especially, uh, both at Evanas, when I was at Wyoms, and now when I'm out as a freelance researcher, to be able to give women space uh, uh, and be able to realize some of these achievements that they can they can be give, they can achieve when they are given that space. Next slide. Um, this is some of the other things that I've been doing uh, uh, with Evanas uh, as a thought leader. Because when we started this company in 2019, uh, our agenda was to be able to give women and girls space in entrepreneurship. When I look at cities, it has very several areas of entrepreneurship. We also have the women who are very low in terms of um, from, from, the, from the households who do not really have, I could say, academic knowledge, but we opened the space to bring them into entrepreneurship, show them in areas where they can be able to get an income out of what they understand in terms of ocean economy, be able to build, suggest and build small markets that can be able to sustain women in activities that are able to benefit them and their families within the ocean ecosystem. So one of those women in research who did some work with South Africa, uh, nanotechnology and women were there. They were key in trying to, uh, to help us understand how we can use nanotechnology and, and in, in waste management, management, sorry. And then uh, uh, training with, with the USAID on women in, in entrepreneurship where we are partners as even us. And of course, improving the lives of women through research 
those who can and through entrepreneurship, those who are able to do that. Next slide. Um, my simple final thoughts will be that, that as a woman, I have been mentored by others. When I when entered into this space, people like Jacqueline Uku, they were able to introduce me to the ocean space and I was able to be mentored there and use now my class knowledge in terms of planning to be able to merge what can be done in 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 a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a ocean economy with my knowledge of cities and i've been a, we were able to put that together and uh, from that i've also been able to mentor many women through training uh, the project that overcame is part of came through uh, my program and others that are within the group and women have been able to come up strongly in the maritime field in in in, in planning and they, they have been able to use their knowledge to be able to make change. One thing I'd like to say is that you can do, as a woman, wherever you are, you can make a change, whether you are in the homestead or, in a, or in, you're in a boardroom, and then use your skills. Use your skills to be able to do the necessary in terms of sustainable communities. And then I'm telling you that there are challenges. There will be challenges always. However, remember that you can always cross the bridge when you are right there. So don't give up keep going. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Valentine. Um, I'm going to move on to the next speaker before we have questions. Um, Susan. Susanna is an upcoming ocean scientist and a budding science communicator based in Kenya. She will share her perspective on conservation technologies and their marine applications in advancing ocean science. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you for all the presenters for just showcasing the variety of um, experience and knowledge in this network. And I am very privileged to speak here. I would like to just share a few perspectives on innovation and technology, especially in advancing ocean science in this decade of ocean science that we're in. So allow me to take you through a few perspectives and a few, a few thoughts on um, my journey so far and what I would like to share with you. So I got into marine conservation after graduating in 2020 with an undergrad in environmental science. I then interned at Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute with oceanographers and seagrass researchers. And this really opened the door for me to understand the wealth of marine life and diversity and the amazing work that's being done by scientists all around. And this time last year, a call came out to apply for a program that would teach women how to use conservation technologies in their, in their research work. And I was prompted and urged by my mentors uh, to apply for this. And I applied for this program thinking about how we can adapt technology for the marine space and how this might be an interesting frontier to be a part of. And so luckily enough, I was um, accepted into the program and I was alongside 15 other women who are conservationists from terrestrial and marine backgrounds. And some of the key things that came out of this training was that technology is the next frontier. And we as marine scientists should look towards it. Data from different technological tools gives us a better visualization and more informed uh, data to make decision making and help us with practical solutions in the work we do. Conservation technologies also needs to apply a lot of ethics and approaches with communities. Um, and like the presenters before have been very community centered in their presentations. There's technologies that you can adapt when you're going out to the field and that you can teach communities to gather data that is open data for you. And these softwares are open source and available and easily accessible. And there's opportunity for innovation where in the technological age with AI and machine learning rapidly um, developing and we should look towards it as an area of opportunity for us to tap into. So the, there are several opportunities that I envision that we as marine scientists and marine conservationists in the WIO region can tap into. That is uh, camera traps and underwater imaging. We had uh, someone spoke about uh, people not and communities not being able to 
um, understand the world, the breadth of uh, the work we do because they don't see what is underneath the water. And I am very passionate about underwater imaging and this, the potential this has to generate a lot of ocean conservation awareness. And this is just one application of conservation technology that we can all look forward to. And there's a wealth of tech out there. There is droning, satellite imagery, thermal sensing, passive acoustic monitoring, and it's just an entire ocean of technology that we can start looking towards in terms of looking towards the future. So I would love to leave us with a few reflections um, on how we can tap into this tide of advancement in technology. And this is a wave that we can all join in on, whether we're in our early careers like me or we're in our mid-level or senior levels in our career. We can look towards adopting new skills and learning online. There's available free accessible tutorials that can teach us GIS, data analysis, and machine learning. And these are trainings that we can go towards as young people. We can also look towards growing and forging new networks for collaboration for new innovation. Majority of the conservation technology that we were exposed to in this training that was led by Wild Labs is that it's mostly terrestrial based. And there's a gap and a niche possibly for us to develop new software and new hardware for that is specifically adapted to the marine environments that we can use in the work that we do. Finally, we can also um, tap into this new wave of advancement through knowledge sharing, through conservation uh, tech community platforms, such as wildlabs.net that you can always log into in your free time. But also I would just love to leave us in the interest of time with this one reflection is that the future for us as women in the sciences and in STEM, especially in the Western Indian Ocean region is that it is the future is digital, it is collaborative and it is innovative. And so I would also like to encourage um, other young women in this space to acquire and specialize skills um, in technology and also join the WIMS network because this network really exposes you to women who have gone before and amazing mentors who can guide us in this journey. So thank you for your time and for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Susanna. It's quite enlightening and the types of technologies that we can actually apply to our research. Um, so we're going to take on questions. So we've got questions for Dr. Valentine as well as Susanna. And then I'll also look through the questions that are in the chat, in the Q&A. So one of the first questions, and I think that we've been repeating and it's still very relevant, is what are some of the challenges that you have faced? Um, so we'll start with you, Dr. Valentine, especially um, in terms of transitioning from working from working and working for quite some time and then transitioning now to being a freelancer as well as starting a business avenue. So what are some of the challenges that you are facing as a woman and also in bringing in other women into your business avenues and research? Uh, thank you, Ava King. Uh, also, just be uh, quick on this one. One thing about um, some of the challenges that we face, especially when we are women, is dealing with an environment where you have gentlemen, and sometimes that can really drag you down, and you have to take a lot of energy, as Nancy said, trying to prove yourself, and and reaches a point where that energy just dries up. But one thing I want to encourage you is that there's always a little spark inside, so find that little spark and then move on and be able to do something for yourself. Then the other challenge, of course, uh, moving from having worked from uh, being an, a, an, an executive officer to being a lecturer in a university for uh, nine years, then working with Wyomsa for almost five and a half years, and now on my own, there's, there's the, the aspect of having the freedom to be able to, of thought, to be able to explore a wider range of advantages 
But the other thing is that now trying to break into the market. Though we started the company a long time ago and we were able to do many things with the Tony Lumelu company, I mean, uh, funding and others, but there are still challenges that you are going to be able to face in trying to break into new grounds. But as you break, but as those challenges coming into breaking new grounds, you press on, as I said, because someone said you need to go there and out there and be consistent because fortune will, will only favor those ones who are brave. And then the other thing with working with ladies is sometimes like from what I've experienced, ladies need to be nudged and nudged and nudged and then uh, and encouraged and, you know, give them some... Uh, Um, I think Valentine just froze. Oh man, and she was getting right to the juicy stuff. I'm sorry, um, I think we'll have to wait for Valentine to come back. Um, she's just frozen now. Um, can we get um, Susanna, can you please answer? Um, give us your perspective, please, on challenges. Okay, I can uh, give my perspective, although I've only been like two and a half years in this field, but I can share some of the challenges that I've faced and possibly have overcome them. Um, I was trying to overcome them at the moment. So one of the um, biggest challenges that I've had is imposter syndrome and also impatience, because I think as a young person in this generation, we want things very quickly. So um, learning how to be patient with the journey to just learn and um, experience research uh, through following other researchers really helped me um, understand that this is a field that you need to dedicate time to if you are very interested in it. And if you love it, you need to dedicate that time. And, um, and that, you know, with that dedication and with that time and by being faithful, available and teachable, um, you can always learn how to, um, to, to adapt yourself into a new space and that, you know, as you interact with other people in the space, you get to learn more. And so those are my very few challenges, um, but I'm really excited that I was able to um, adapt that reasoning and that's what has helped me so far. And I look forward to being in this space somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking through the questions as well as the comments. And I think because this is interactive and we want to be keeping it open to um, our guests in the webinar, I'm also going to read um, one of the comments. So this comment comes from Charlotte Decker, who says somehow, okay, she can't use the chat, but she'd like to say thank you so much for this great online event. It has been very inspiring to listen to the amazing speakers, um, R.E. Nancy. Um, I say um, all, I say you are all great role models. Thank you. And then another one comes from Karen Allen. It says, thanks Susanna, such a great overview of where conservation technology is moving and how it's, how it's advancing, very inspirational. And then there's, um, okay, there's a question for Valentine. So I'll wait for Valentine to come back online um, in order to ask the question. Unless um, in terms of technology and um, there's been mentions of AI, I'll still ask the question. Um, so Bridget asks, um, what is the role of women in adaptation in adopting the fourth industrial revolution in addressing pollution issues in coastal communities? Um, you can, think about the question. And if there's anybody who would like to answer the question, um, please feel free to answer that question. And another question, this one is directly for Susan. Um, it's also from Bridget. She says, good work on the environmental conservation. What is the importance of women taking up space in the area of marine science? And how can we adapt to, changing, to the changing times, especially with adverse climate change? Okay, thank you for uh, the question. I think the role that women play is that we inspire other people. And if women take up the role, if you take up the role to be visible in the space, 
then there's other people you will inspire who will look up to you. And I think, because today is the International Day for Women and Girls in Science, in particular, it's an amazing day that if you are visible about sharing your work today with another little girl, then, you know, it starts the chain. And not only for girls, but also for other young people like boys, you know, they can see, once you see a woman taking up a space, it really opens the door. Uh, personally, uh, my mentor is Dr. Uku, and I saw her taking up the space. And so I knew that, oh, there's a space I could take up as a marine researcher, you know? And so that's how I modeled um, some of my um, aspirations. And I think that's the role that, you know, that women play. And in terms of climate change adaptation and um, how we can better approach it, I think we need to just be open-minded to adapting new skills and changing with, with the times. We need to um, be collaborative and to see what new networks and partnerships we can form um, across sectors, across the private public sectors and see how can we develop new solutions, new technologically based solutions to address some of these challenges. So those are my perspectives. Uh, thank, okay, you. thank you. Thank you, Abake. Um, just to, to respond a bit to uh, Dr. Bridget's question on how we can be able to use technology um, in, in, in plastic waste. Just as Sue has said, the issue is, is the issue of partnerships because some of us went to class, we did planning, others went and did uh, chemistry, others went and did mining and processing, engineering. And what, what thing, one thing I've noticed that for us to be able to solve some of this problem, for example, plastic waste in coastal systems, it will require a good partnership among scientists. That's from marine scientists to, to natural scientists, to engineers. And one of the good technologies that we, we tried when I was still at Royal Science Nanotechnology and we are trying it now in large scale, being able to use those plastic waste to produce something that is sustainable and that can be used and at the end of it uh, all can, can is, is, is um, not uh, challenging to the environment. So nanotechnology comes in uh, from what I've seen out here as one of a good solution of some of those uh, challenges in coastal systems. Apart from that, I think there are other technologies and systems uh, and waste management structures that have been developed globally and they're slowly being incorporated in, a, in our normal uh, living uh, uh, environment. And that is helping us to be able to take away the challenge of pollution and waste management. So I think Bridget, as a chemist, we can be able to look at it in terms of material chemistry and how we can be able to make sure that we have proper materials in the environment. And then we can be able also to take out those materials when we are done with our processing systems. So that would um, would be my answer on that one. Thank you, Oba King. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure, Valentine. Um, my last question, um, also from Dr. James Cairo, is that um, for, this is also for all the speakers, especially the ones who are working with restoration. Um, how are you addressing sustainability of mangrove startups such as beekeeping, tourism, and other startups that are linked to mangroves. And I just want to extend it. Um, it's also in terms of the sustainability of a lot of the startups that we are seeing. So how can we maintain the sustainability and address it? This question is open to all the panelists. I can, um, I can start the, the discussion. About, I think this is the most challenging issue. Uh, the way I'm trying to address is with very good uh, business plans for the end of the, of the project and trying to connect with other uh, big keepers uh, of the region and try to make um, commercial solutions for all these beekeeping groups. It's not easy because different NGOs and projects have different agendas, different timelines. But I think if you have more product and have a product of the region, it will be easier to, to put the product uh, on than with a small quantity. So that is the approach we're trying, I'm trying to do with beekeeping. But uh, I don't know, I can speak in three years to see if I manage to to address the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
hopefully as in three years we'll invite you again for an update that would be interesting um are they does do any of the panelists want to chip in on the sustainability of the startups yes something um yeah it's a very difficult one to handle because the Teka fellowship is specifically that um funding innovations and technology, they are giving us grants to experiment with different ways of achieving sustainability. One of those is decentralized autonomous organizations, so DAOs, where individuals that are all working towards a common goal, in our case, it is exploring alternative livelihoods to support the work of restoration. What happens is that we then would have a pool of money that is raised through crowdfunding to sustain those ventures and, and keep them um, sustainable in that way. It, the funding is so new, literally the press release was released two days ago or so, that we don't yet have results that prove that there is sustainability, but that's sort of the way we're looking at it to see if we can crowd raise um, through these DAOs for these um, alternative livelihoods. So it's it's still very much exploratory, but also one other thing is we're in contact with gaming um, organizations that the proceeds of their gaming dividends go towards um, projects that are rural, small scale and achieving um, climate action specifically for carbon credits. So those are really proceeds that are given from a philanthropy point of view. Um, and while I know philanthropy is not really great for sustainability because when it stops, you're kind of stuck, but we're trying to see if we can catalyze um, uh, sustainability and greater gains in, in that mangrove space. But yes, it, it is a difficult uh, one to solve for currently. Thank you. And I hope we can, even with um, the guests that we have on the webinar, um, we can also start forming partnerships and asking more questions, um, more one-to-one -one questions. So um, feel free, even um, all the guests in the webinar to register, to become a member on my own side. And if you have any questions or you would like to speak to the panelists, um, you can put send us a message on the question and answers, on the question and answers, or even on Twitter, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and LinkedIn. So we're available on all the socials if you would like to take the conversation further. Um, the last question that there is, um, wait, actually, I, I don't think I can take the last question um, in the interest of time. Um, I would like to introduce, I think we've come to the end of the webinar. Nelly, am I right? Okay. Um, I can't see Nelly for now, um, but I would like to introduce Veronica yeah. Bristol. So um, Veronica is the chairperson of Women, Women, in, Sci Women in Marine Science, of the Women in Marine Science Network, and also the country representative for Seychelles. She's also a member of WOMESA, which is the Association for Women in the Maritime Sector in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, Ms. Bristol has a passion for maritime life and, and the marine industry. Her career in the maritime industry started in the Seychelles Maritime Agency, where she later moved to Fisheries Transparency Initiative before settling, setting up her own business as a maritime practitioner. Veronica, please take it away. Okay. Um, uh, my name is uh, Veronica Bristol. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, um, I'm the chairperson of WIMS, Women in Marine uh, Science. So today we are excited to celebrate this special event of the International Day for Women and Girls in Science. And this year's focus is on the role of women and girls and science in relation to sustainable development goals, the SDGs, uh, resonate with the different levels of our work and as member of WIMSA and WIMS. 
So today, on behalf of WIMS, uh, may I take this opportunity to thank the YMSA Vice President, Dr. YMB, for finding time to be present, and uh, Dr. Jacqueline Aku for the continuous support toward women in marine science. It is well appreciated. Um, our different speakers for the com comprehensive and exciting presentation. We have seen the presentation of Dr. G. Dawi, uh, Ms. Nancy, Ms. Sanke, Ms. Uh, Dr. Isabel, uh, Dr. Valentine, Ms. Uh, Susanna. We thank you for taking your time to share your stories and engage with us. Thank you. In sharing the work, we are able to connect with the successes and challenges, as well as think about ways and means to support and, and create more spaces in, uh, in WIMS for men and women to showcase the work, collaborate, innovate, and increase accessibility for others. And without forgetting the hard work of uh, Dr. Obaken, and Dr. Nelly as uh, moderators, and Lilian and her administrative team. Thank you so much. Since WIMS inception, we have made tremendous progress, both at regional and country level to increase participation. Uh, through these, are but there are still gaps representation. We want to work on that. So may I mention that we are working on our terms of reference for the launching of the different, uh, different WIM chapters at country level, which will definitely increase uh, partic participation of women in the Rio at different country level. We are also working on a, a mentorship program to empower and better cater the needs of our junior scientists. How to make them better independent like Dr. G that we mentioned, Hence, we will also have the uh, senior scientists who will be like guiding, empowering our young scientists. So may I seize this opportunity to welcome everyone to YMSA and WIMS Network. So what you have to do for us membership, for membership, it is open to uh, women, marine scientists or practitioners only at any stage of the career. It can be regardless of uh, professionals, if you are employed, if you are not employed, if you are self-employed, undergraduate, postgraduate students, you are all welcome. Also, uh, female, uh, all female members of the YMSA is given the option to join the WIMS network at the time of registration or renewal of the membership to YMSA. Therefore, membership to YMSA is definitely necessary for joining the WIMS network. So women marine science practitioners should apply for membership as individual rather than through the institution. Also membership uh, to WIMS network is, of, is, is open to women working or living anywhere around the world. So this is no problem if you are elsewhere um, apart from Africa. As Susanna noted in her presentation, the future is digital, the future is young. And I can see a lot of energy and motivation to amplify the science we need for the ocean decade. However, I say, however, there are some requirements to finish strong. There are some attribution that we need to become a, a successful marine scientist or practitioner. We need the perseverance for a strong future to unlock the different opportunities. And without forgetting the, the deep passion as it takes years of sacrifice and hard working to achieve and reap the result we aspire to. So again, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. So, and thank you to all the participants who joined us today in celebration of the International Day for Women and Girls in Science. And um, it's been quite informative. Um, I've also, yes, I'm part of the planning committee, but I also learned a lot, especially in terms of technology. So I'd like to say thank you everyone, everyone for joining us. And we look forward to 
seeing you in our other events, whether they are face-to-face -face or online. And thank you so much. Have a great weekend and a great Friday afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.